<laughs> Glad you liked it. Okay, it's four o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? It's our first class after spring break, so hopefully everyone had a good uh, spring break. Uh, whether you got the chance to rest or you know you took the time to you know get everything in order with your health and you know with the uh, pandemics, you know hopefully hopefully you know you guys took advantage of the spring break. Right? So everyone's doing okay. How's every, how's everyone doing? Pretty good. Nice, nice. It's good. Very cool. Yeah, I, I cooked a lot over spring break too. Um, you know, now's a good time to try out a lot of uh, recipes. Um, so I'm, I'm getting better at making risotto, which is interesting because I, I never liked risotto uh, growing up, uh, but my girlfriend really likes risotto. So I've learned how to cook it uh, mostly for her, but now I'm starting to take, take a liking to it too. Nice. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, senior project's gonna be really, uh, really challenging for you guys with you know with the pandemic. So you know, I wish you guys all the best for that. Nice, nice. All right. Very cool. Um, so, uh, so we're gonna. So the plan for today is uh, we're going to do the next activity. Uh, so some of you guys have uh, have already tried the activity, um, so that's good. Um, but if you haven't yet, that's okay. We're gonna do it all together uh, today. Uh, so it's gonna be an activity to learn about how to do dynamic simulations in ANSYS, because uh, everything up to this point we've just done static simulations where everything just doesn't move at all. Um, which you know, for a lot of things, you don't want them to move. Like you don't you don't want your building to be moving on you when you're uh, standing in it. Um, but for some situations, especially, you know, for a lot of you guys' projects, um, you know, you need to move, you need, it needs to move in order for you to do some proper analysis. Um, you know, and I thought, you know, this activity would be something that's good because a lot of you guys are looking at uh, impact problems where you're looking at the result of, um, you know, what happens if, you know, either an object strikes your, uh, your part or something or your, your part kind of hits something, you know, and you want to see kind of the result that happens from that. So that's basically the subject for today. Um, so I've already posted that. So I posted that kind of before the spring break. Um, so some of you guys have already taken a look. Uh, so what I, so one thing I did over spring break was I, I, I tried to kind of get ahead of the curve as much as I, um, as much as I could. Uh, Cause you know, with the way things are, I know everyone's schedule is a little bit, you know, uncertain at this point, whether, you know, you have to go um, take care of, you know, some real life stuff or, or not. So I wanted to give you guys as much flexibility as, as, as I could, you know, in dealing with the material. Um, especially with this class kind of where we are because you know in this class where we are or where we're going is you know I, I'm I mostly just want to give you guys um, the tools and the information you need to do your projects so uh, what I did was I, I, I you know I, I spent some spring break I, I looked over your, your project proposals um, oh so if you haven't gone on titanium and looked at your feedback then definitely go take a look um, I tried to you know I, I tried to be as detailed as I could with my feedback um, you know, to give you guys kind of as much help as I can, um, you know, with kind of the way things are, it's, it's going to be hard for me to kind of, you know, go around to you guys and see how you're doing. So, um, you know, whenever you guys do submit something like a proposal or uh, with the progress report, um, which I think is doing a couple of weeks, um, I'm going to try to be as kind of detailed as I can with the written feedback. Uh, so if I write a lot to you, uh, you know, I it, don't take it personally. I, I, I write a lot to everyone. Uh, it's, it's I'm just trying to just be as helpful as I can. But uh, like I said, kind of in the announcement email where, you know, a lot of what I, I said, you know, was just suggestions. Um, so ultimately in the end, it, it's gonna be up to you guys, um, you know, if you take the suggestions or not, uh, but it's, it's by no means a requirement, you know, as long as you guys have kind of just the requirements that out, that's outlined in the project specs, uh, then that's, that's gonna be enough for me. Okay? Uh, so the question is, where's the feedback located? So if you go back to Titanium, to the, uh, to the, uh, to the assignment page where you submitted your proposal, um, then you can um, click there, and I think you should be able to see my feedback from from there. Yeah. Some of you guys, some of you guys emailed me too, kind of before the project proposal was due, so I kind of gave you some feedback there uh, as well. But I, I tried to be, you know, as thorough as I can with the titanium feedback. So uh, please make sure you take a look. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so you know, I think one thing to pay attention to on the feedback was I, um, you know, I, I looked at kind of what you what you were trying to do with your project. Um, and then, uh, you know, I tried to, you know, give you some, um, you know, I try to point you in certain directions, whether to say to either take a look at ANSYS activity four, 
um, if you're if you have a moving part um, or if, for other kinds of uh, handouts that I posted. So if I you know if I told you to kind of look at something that I posted, definitely take a look at that because I think it'll be something that'll be really useful for your for your project. Okay, so there's a question on the plastic strain. So I think maybe we'll 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 talk about that kind of later once we get to the um, to that part of the activity today. Okay. Um, so the other question is, if we need help outside the class, will email suffice? Um, so if you if you if you feel okay with the emails, that's that's definitely open. So you know I, I try to be as a uh, you know quick to answer emails as I can. Uh, but I know you can't, you know, there's there's some issues where it's really hard to kind of explain an email and to kind of you know have that back and forth. So um, even so, you know, my office hours are open, so you can join the Zoom meeting and you, you can share your screen um, and we can kind of debug issues that way. But if the office hours times don't work with you, you can just let me know um, and I can create a private Zoom room just kind of for us to kind of talk and, and have that. So um, I'm basically home most of the day. So, um, you know, anytime that works for you, just send me an email and then we, we can kind of easily set up the time to, to chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so another announcement I wanted to make regarding the project is originally, I think um, we had the due, I had, I set the due date to be originally when we we're supposed to have our final exam, um, which was the Tuesday of finals week. Um, but we, but because of the way things are, and I know people, you know, generally are, are going to need more time to work on this um, at home, especially kind of without face-to-face -face interactions. I want to push that back. Um, so I still, I still need enough time to grade it. And I have other class projects that I need to grade too. Um, so let's push it back a week. So let's push let's push it back to the Tuesday after um, it was originally due. So I think that'll be so originally it was due on Tuesday, May 12th. So let's have it due on Tuesday, May 19th um, instead. Um, that way, because I think grades are due that Friday. So that gives me a few days to, to grade. And I think that's that's basically all I need. So uh, hopefully that extra week will be helpful to you guys, especially, you know, um, at, you know, by that time, hope you guys are done with final exams and you can you can work on the project too. So, uh, so let's do that. Okay. Um, so the project is going to be due Tuesday, May nineteenth now instead of Tuesday, May twelfth. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, I think that's all the announcements that I had. So, are there any just general questions about the project, um, or just anything about the class in general that I can answer before we get started today? Okay, um, so if you have questions, definitely feel free to chime in. Um, when, with that, let me share my screen. Um, so if um, so, we're going to be doing ANSYS activity four. So if you want to follow along, um, definitely you can open ANSYS. Um, and actually, it'd be good to follow along because you're going to be uh, turning this in. So kind of doing it in real time now will kind of save you some work down the line. But if you just want to, uh, you know, watch, that's that's perfectly fine too. Okay. Uh, so I posted the PDF on online, so you can download that and check it out. Uh, and I've also posted the uh, the CAD file. Uh, so the CAD file that we're going to use is the car crash um, geometry. Okay. Um, so I posted two different versions of it because uh, someone tried it out over spring break, uh, and the in the original file, which was in the IGS version, wasn't working for them. Uh, but then they said that uh, when they converted to STEP using SolidWorks, then that worked for them. So I I posted two versions. So if you if you have kind of a more recent version of ANSYS. Um, I'm using 2020 on my computer. The, the IGS version should work. Um, and then, but if not, then you have um, the, uh, the step version. All right, no problem. Yeah, um, uh, question on the project? Go ahead. Does ANSYS take STL file? I, I, I've never tried it. Um, my intuition is going to be no, because uh, I think the STL file is just a, uh, I don't think it has information on like distinct parts and faces. I think it's just, I think it's literally just the mesh um, of the geometry, but I could be wrong. Um, I've, I've just never personally tried it. You can, you can, you can definitely try. Um, and if it works, it works. But uh, if it's not, then you probably have to convert. I know things like IGS and, um, and step files will work for sure uh, for ANSYS. Okay, so there's another kind of, uh, kind of specific question on multi-phasic. Yeah, I remember I remember reading your uh, project uh, specs on that. Um, so I think that that problem is a little bit unique to you. So I think maybe we'll talk offline about that um, about the multi-phasic stuff.
Okay, any more questions on the uh, on the project before we start the activity today? Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, uh, so here's ANSYS. Okay, so the, uh, um, the, the theme for the project today or the activity is we're going to be simulating a car crash. Okay. Um, so to do that, if you uh, haven't already, you can go ahead and open ANSYS and we're going to run what's called an explicit dynamic simulation. Okay. Because um, kind of like what we practiced at the beginning of lecture, you know, up to this point, we've, we've only been doing simulations on um, parts that just stay perfectly still. Uh, which is great for a lot of, uh, you know, uh, for a lot of engineering situations because there's a lot of engineering structures that you don't want to move. Uh, but some, but sometimes, you know, you necessarily have to have things move. Um, you know, for some people, that's that's kind of where they make the distinction between civil engineers, where they make, you know, structures that aren't supposed to move, and mechanical engineers, which make things that that move, like cars and airplanes and such. Okay? Uh, so today we're going to be doing a, a car crash. Okay. Uh, so if you haven't already. Um, Go ahead and download the uh, the PDF and the uh, and the geometry, okay? And you should see kind of the picture of uh, what we're going to be doing there. Okay? Um, so basically, what I'm what the plan for today is, I'm just going to walk you through the uh, the steps and the activity, okay? Okay. So the first step is we have to define the uh, the physics um, that we're going to simulate in ANSYS. So normally, uh, when we do this, we usually use the static structural here, okay? Um, out of the many different physics that are uh, applied. So the, the static and static structural basically means that this, uh, um, this uh, is not going to move at all, right? Um, so instead, what we're going to use is we're going to use the explicit dynamics, okay? So let's uh, click explicit, di explicit dynamics and drag it over here, okay? So that's going to um, create the object just like that, okay? And the next step is we need to import the geometry. So just like before, let's right-click geometry and let's click import. So I've already, uh, I've tried it out kind of before this, so I, I've already loaded it, but if you uh, haven't done that yet, we can go ahead and browse. So you go ahead and browse to the location where you've downloaded the geometry, okay? And then you can double click that, um, the IGS, and then you can load the geometry in just like that, okay? All right, so maybe I'll give uh, everyone just a couple minutes to, uh, uh, to, get, to catch up. Let me see if I can bring up the chat. Okay. Okay. So now that we've done that, the next step is that uh, we're going to um, import some materials. Okay. Uh, so we've done this before. So we've uh, we've created separate uh, new materials that we we can use in Ansys. Um, so in the past, what we've done is we've um, completely created a custom material. Uh, which is good to know because uh, you know if you have if you have some kind of material that has some strange properties, it's it's good to know how to import that. Um, but for a lot of common a lot of common materials, you know, Ansys actually already has that built in. So let's let's kind of go over how we do that. So um, just like we did before, let's double click this engineering data right here to open up the uh, the data tab. Okay. And you can see by doing that, we've uh, we've opened up this new menu here. Okay, for uh, for engineering data. Um, so you can see we have our default material. So the default material that we have is structural steel. Um, so we're going to use this, but we're going to use this for the wall. But actually, you know, for the car, um, we're going to assume it's made of aluminum. Okay. Uh, so the way that we can add aluminum is we can we can do it the way we did before. We can create a new material and define its properties that way. Okay. But aluminum is actually a pretty common material. So it's uh, Ansys already actually has it loaded. So the way that we can actually load it in is we can click this button right here called Engineering Data Sources, okay? And you can see that it's gonna bring up a, a new menu here for, um, for the project, okay? Um, where we can load materials. So the first, the first, your first stop is gonna be this top menu right here. So this top menu kind of gives you the broad kind of categories of materials that ANSYS has into it, okay? So it has this um, category called Granted Design Sample Materials. So I have no idea what that means, so we're not going to uh, go there. Okay. Uh, we have general materials, which uh, are kind of the uh, materials for general use. Um, so actually our, our aluminum is going to be in here. Uh, but you can see some other stuff that they have here, like additive manufacturing, composites, um, um, nonlinear materials, and a, and a bunch of other stuff. Okay. Um, 
but the uh, the place we're going to look is in general materials. Okay, so let's go ahead and left click that. And then after you left click this general material, you should see this middle menu uh, change right here. So you can see all the uh, um, all the general materials that they have here. Okay, uh, so you come at the top here. You have air. Um, so you can make your part of air if you want. So that you know for, that's mostly just for fluid mechanic simulations. Um, but besides that, you have things like aluminum, uh, concrete, copper, um, FR4, cast iron, uh, magnesium, um, polyethylene, which we're going to use later too, um, steel, and titanium. Okay? Uh, so this is really nice. Uh, so if your material is here, to add the material to your project, it's actually really simple. All you have to do is click this um, plus button right here. It's, it's right under the add. Okay. Okay, so now that we've uh, added that to our project, um, and let's add one more. So let's uh, just uh, for later on, since we want to do a, uh, a simulation if our car was made of plastic, let's go ahead and add polyethylene. Okay. All right. Um, and so to get back to, uh, to our original uh, menu, you can click this engineering data sources button again. And then when you do that, you come back to right here. So you can see this is the list of materials that are going to be available to us. So you can see we have structural steel, just like before. Um, so that was loaded by default. But then also we have aluminum alloy, and we also have polyethylene, which, you, which we just loaded just now, OK? OK. Um, so that's uh, so with that, we've added all the materials, and we're ready to jump into ANSYS Mechanical. But before we do that, are there uh, any questions I can answer? Right. Okay. So let's uh, let's do that again. So the uh, for the materials, you can go to the engineering data sources here, right? So it's this button with the uh, kind of the um, library of books next to it. Um, so this is you kind of think of this as their library of materials. So then you go from there, you go to general materials, you left click that, and then from here you can see all the materials that you have available to you. So to add one, you basically just click this plus button right here. So you click plus, um, and it's going to add it to your um, add it to your project. So we did that for aluminum alloy, and we also did that for polyethylene, which is a uh, plastic. And then when you're done, you can just click this uh, this button up here again, and it'll bring you back to this menu right here. Okay. All right. So question. So the question is, uh, why don't we make the wall concrete instead of steel? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, there's not that many uh, walls that are made of steel. So a lot of times they're made of concrete. Um, but in this uh, in this simulation, the wall is actually not going to deform um, that much. Uh, in fact, it's it's hardly going to deform at all. So I think if we were interested in kind of prop, uh, crack propagation within the wall itself, um, or the stresses within the wall, then we would we would definitely choose concrete for the wall. Um, but for this case, we're mostly just interested in the car, um, so we can just leave it as the default. We just need it to be something pretty solid. It's uh, not going to be um, it's not going to deform that much. Yeah, good question though. All right, so the, another question, what grade of aluminum is being added? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Um, so it just as a generic aluminum alloy. Um, so definitely, you know, if you have a, if you know, for your projects, if you know the specific uh, grade of aluminum that you're going to be using, uh, definitely input that in by hand because the, uh, um, the one right here, we can check, we can check the materials and we can check the properties here. Um, so you can check um, the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Uh, so it's around right here. Um, so I, I'm not too big of a materials, um, strength of materials guy, so I'm not sure what grade that represents. Uh, but this is basically the properties that we have. So if this doesn't match up with um, kind of what you expect for aluminum, it would be good to kind of add your own custom, um, your own custom value there. Yeah. All right, any other questions on the uh, materials before we uh, we jump into mechanical? So the question is, does the IGS file come from an assembly? I, I believe so. Um, so it's, it's been a while since I, I really played around with SolidWorks uh, quite a bit. But I think if you have an assembly, um, you can click kind of save as in SolidWorks and you can save it as, a, as an IGS file. I think the default is, uh, is to save it as a SolidWorks assembly file. Uh, but you can save it in a lot of different formats. And I think IGS is one of those, uh, one of those formats. But I think you can save part files as IGS um, files too. Okay. 
All right, so let's, uh, so let's move on. So now that we're done with the engineering data, we can go ahead and close this tab. So we can uh, click close right here. So that'll bring us back to our original menu here. Uh, so to open up ANSYS Mechanical, uh, we'll just double click model here, okay? Which I should have done while I was answering questions because it's gonna take a while to load, but that's okay. Okay, so here we've loaded our part, okay? So you can see uh, our geometry consists of two separate uh, entities. So we have our wall right here. So our wall is just a rectangle. So it's just a part of a wall. And then we have our car. Uh, so this is like, um, you know, those uh, top 10 photos taken right before disaster uh, kind of thing. Okay. okay, so the first thing that we have to do is we have to um, specify the material properties of each of our parts. Um, so to do that, um, we go to this geometry tab right here. So we click this plus button down for the geometry. Okay, and we see that we have two separate parts. So we have part one, uh, which is our car, and then part two, which is our wall. Okay, so by clicking their names in this menu here, they'll highlight in the 3D screen. Okay, um, so actually, you know, just to make things easier for you to remember, you can rename these, right? Um, so instead of a generic part one, we can rename this to car. And then for part two, we can rename this to wall. Uh, so of course, you know, you don't have to do this. Um, actually in the document, I, I, I don't do this, but um, you know, it's always a good practice to kind of stay organized with these things. Cause in this case, we only have two different parts. So it's kind of easy to, uh, to keep track. Uh, but if you're, uh, you know, doing a simulation with lots and lots of parts, uh, it's good to kind of keep track, easily kind of look and keep track of which is which. Okay, okay so let's change some material properties. So uh, from the project specs, we know that our car is going to be made of this aluminum alloy, right? Uh, so do that, like go ahead and left click car, and then you can see in the bottom right here for the details. Okay, so by looking at this line right here, we see the material assignment right now is currently structural steel. So we want to change this to aluminum. So go ahead and click this arrow here. And then go ahead and click aluminum alloy, which is a material, which is the material that we've loaded previously. Okay. So go ahead and do that. And then now uh, we have um, our cars made of aluminum. Okay. And if you want to check the wall, you can definitely check the wall. So you can see the wall here is made of structural steel right now. Okay. So remember, you know, uh, we're not too interested in what's happening to the wall. We're, we're basically just going to assume this wall is going to be indestructible. Um, but if this was a problem where, you know, if you want to see, you know, if the, if the wall was actually going to break apart um, as a result of this car hitting it, then you have to make sure that you specify the correct material properties for the wall too. But, um, and this, and just for this analysis, we're only interested in the, in the car. So um, that's kind of what we're going to focus on. Okay. Okay. And then one more thing before we go into the, uh, into uh, meshing is that we need to uh, set the connections. Okay. Um, so just like uh, we saw with our signpost, where uh, you remember our signpost was a, uh, an assembly of different parts. This is an assembly of two different parts. Um, so ANSYS needs to know how these parts are going to interact before it can run the simulation. Um, so by default, um, you know, when it sees two parts like this in, you know, in very close contact like this, um, ANSYS is going to assume that they're bonded. So basically that they're, they're going to be welded together. Um, so in this case, we don't want that. We don't want the, um, this car to be welded. Um, so in order to do that, we need to uh, basically delete this contact region, okay? So if you go under connections uh, from the project outline, and then you go under contacts, and you click this contact region, and you can see we have a contact region in between the front bumper of the car and the wall, okay? And then by looking at the details here, we see that this, uh, this contact is specified as bonded, okay? Uh, so which means that ANSYS is going to assume that these, these two things are going to be, um, you know, bonded together. Uh, which is not what we want. So what we want is this car to basically hit the wall and then we want it to, you know, um, bounce off if it can. So in order to do this, we can um, just go ahead and delete this. Okay. So uh, to delete it, we can just go ahead and right click this and then click uh, delete. Okay. Uh, so when you delete this, um, then ANSYS is basically going to assume that these two separate, these parts are completely separate uh, and that they're going to, you know, make contact and then kind of bounce off again after that. Um, but if, you know, for your projects, um, 
you know, where you have uh, some complex mating in between the different parts, you want to make sure that you set the contacts appropriately. So for some cases, you know, no, no contact at all is going to be appropriate. Uh, but for sometimes, you know, you might want to set uh, a frictional contact. Um, so ANSYS has the ability to do that. Um, I personally haven't experimented much with it, but I know that the features are, are there. Um, and for some cases, you might want to kind of constrain things in one direction or not. Um, so it really depends on the situation that you're trying to simulate. But in this case, we want uh, no contact at all. So we're just going to delete this. Okay. okay. So now that uh, we don't have any contacts, we can go ahead and uh, get rid of that. And then now we're set to begin the, the meshing. Okay. Uh, so before we get into the meshing, are there uh, any questions? I deleted the contact. Um, so the body interactions, we, we still want them to interact with each other, um, uh, but we, uh, we just don't want them to, to have contact. Um, so we can see right here from the body interaction in between the two, um, or just overall for all bodies, we assume that they're going to be frictionless, which is uh, kind of what we want. Uh, so we'll keep the body interactions, but we'll delete the contacts. Okay? All right, and then there was a question of uh, going back to the material assignment. So we can do that again really quickly. Uh, so the material assignment is done under the geometry tab here in the project outline. Uh, so to do that, uh, left click on the part that you want to change the material for. So in this case, it's the car. The car is what we want to change the material for. Um, and then when we, uh, once we go down there, uh, we can change the assignment here under materials. Um, so you just click this arrow and you select from this list here uh, which material that you want. All right, any more questions before we uh, get into the, uh, the meshing? Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and mesh. Um, so here we have two different bodies. Uh, so we need to define the mesh for both of them. Uh, so just like we always do, we're gonna define uh, two different objects. So we need to define a method object. Um, which defines the element order and the element shape that we're going to use. Um, and we also need to define a sizing. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so the way that we usually do this is we, uh, we do this from this meshing button here. So go ahead and right click mesh and go ahead and insert. Um, so let's go ahead and insert a method object just like we usually do. Okay. Right. Uh, so let's first, let's do the wall first. Um, so the, remember the wall is not too important, but we wanna make sure that we, uh, we define a mesh for it. So go ahead and uh, click, left click the wall so that it is selected and turns green. And then on the bottom left right here, go ahead and click apply for the geometry, okay? All right. So this lets us pick uh, the, uh, the shapes and also the, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the element order for the wall, okay? So uh, since this wall is, is literally just a, a rectangular box, we know that the best way to mesh this is gonna be used is to use a hexahedron. So let's use hex dominant, okay? Right. And then at this point, we usually choose the element order. Um, so you would do this here. Um, so kind of our intuition, uh, based on what we've learned in the past, is that because this is a structural mechanics simulation, uh, we want to use a quadratic element order. Uh, but the thing is, with, uh, with when you do dynamic simulations, um, they're computationally a lot more expensive than the static one, because we basically have to simulate this um, many, many times at different time steps. Uh, so for those uh, for those reasons, um, Ansys actually likes to use linear elements uh, for explicit dynamics, um, uh, and actually won't let you choose quadratic. Uh, so you have to be careful doing that. So you know when we, when we use linear elements, we know that we're kind of in danger of uh, uh, shear mocking. Um, so you want really want when you use uh, when you do explicit dynamic simulations, you really want to make sure you get a good mesh density on this, and you do your uh, your mesh convergence tests. Uh, to really make sure that you have enough mesh density to make sure that you're uh, you're computing your solutions correctly. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so that's the method object for the uh, for the wall. So let's create a sizing object. Okay. So let's go ahead and click the wall. Okay. And then let's um, set a size. So remember the wall. We don't really matter. We don't really care too much. Uh, so we just we can just use a coarse mesh on this. Uh, so actually the default mesh of 17.494, I think that should be sufficient here. Um, 
but if we, you know, again, if we were interested in kind of the dynamics of the wall, we can, uh, we can change that as well. Okay. Um, and then just like we usually do, let's rename this. Okay. Um, so let's rename this to wall method. Okay. And then let's rename this to wall size. So the keyboard shortcut for renaming is F2. So that's, that's basically what it did. But if you uh, don't want to do that, you can just always right click and uh, click uh, rename here, not delete, rename. Okay. okay, so that's the wall. So the wall, um, you know, we, uh, we don't care too much. So we're just going to use the basic settings there. But now let's mesh the car. Okay. So let's go ahead and insert a method for the car. Um, so just like before, we'll left click the car to select it. And then we'll hit apply here for the geometry. Uh, so for the car, this is this is actually pretty interesting. So the car, um, you know, obviously we have some curved um, some curved edges here. Um, so some hexes might be, I mean, uh, tetrahedrons might be good there. But we also have a lot of actually uh, really straight segments here um, as well, uh, where hexes might be pretty good. Um, so actually, let's try it. So actually, I, I think when I was doing this activity myself, I kind of let um, ANSYS decide. Um, but let's see what happens if we do hex dominant. Okay. And what's this? Okay, Ansys doesn't like that. So actually, let's go back to the automatic method. Um, so let's uh, let's let Ansys choose here. So I think I think it's going to choose mostly tets. Um, so actually, let's see what happens when we use tets here. Yeah. So I think it's uh, it's going to want to use uh, tets as well. Okay. And again, um, you know, for the element order, normally we pick quadratic here because it's, we're doing a, a structural dynamic simulation. Um, but uh, because we're using dynamics, it only lets us pick linear. So um, we'll just let it choose the global size. Okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and click sizing because we want to uh, define the size of the mesh on the car as well. Okay. And then let's choose something a lot smaller here. So the default here is 17 and a half. So let's do something smaller of like uh, eight, okay. eight millimeters. And then just like before, we can um, do, uh, we can rename these. We'll call this car method. And we'll call this car size. Okay. So now that we've defined a method and a sizing object for the mesh, uh, for the wall and the car, so let's go ahead and produce a mesh. So remember, we can do that by right clicking mesh and then clicking generate mesh. Okay, and then Ansys is going to produce the mesh. Right. And you can see we have this mesh right here. Okay. So you can see we have the, uh, the wall. Uh, which is uh, element size of 17 and a half. So actually we can make we can make this a little bit bigger if, if we want um, But you know, we can leave this as, as is and for the car we have elements that are size uh, 8 millimeters okay? uh, So just like we did before we can check the the number of elements in the mesh So we can left click mesh here and then we can click statistics and then we can see we have 13,500 elements uh, So it might be a little bit a lot. Uh, so I might have to change this later But let's uh, roll with this now and and then kind of go from from here uh, so for this activity, you know, I'm just going to kind of roll with kind of this, I call this kind of a default mesh. Um, but for the activity, when you do it yourself, you can feel free to make this kind of um, as you want. So you can make the wall more coarse. Um, and that actually might be a good idea because uh, we don't really care too much about what happened in the wall. And you might want to make the car more refined. But I'll leave those decisions up to up to you guys, um, you know, what you want to do. Okay. So the only thing is that, uh, so, to get, uh, so to get credit for the assignment, I want you to take a, uh, a screenshot of the uh, um, of your final mesh, as well as a, a uh, some text description of kind of what you chose for the settings. Okay, um, and if you remember, kind of right before we uh, we went over on spring break, we went over the mesh convergence tests. Um, so the you can certainly perform a mesh convergence test to kind of see what density of the mesh that you need for the car, um, but that's not going to be uh, required. Okay, um, or I should say that um, you know for most for most of you guys, it's not going to be required. Um, but as you, but you know, for those of you who are taking it for graduate credit, you know that you have to do some extra assignments in order to uh, to get credit for this. Um, so if you're taking this class for graduate credit, then I'm going to say that you have to do a mesh convergence test on this guy, uh, just to make to find kind of the most optimum mesh density here. Um, so if you're taking it as a grad student, you have to do that. Uh, but if not, then it's going to be optional. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so before we go into the loads and constraints, are there uh, any questions?
All right. So it looks like there's uh, there's no questions. So, uh, oh, question. Uh, so the method that we use for the wall. So the the only thing that we can define for uh, dynamic simulations is the the shape of the element. Uh, so for the wall, the only thing that we did was we um, we specified it to be hexahedrons um, or hex dominant hex dominant mesh. Yeah. Right. So for the size, um, um, you know, you you can. Uh, um, you know, that's, that's kind of up to you guys. So for the wall, I, I chose kind of the default size, which is 17 and a half. Um, so you can coarsen that if you want. And then for the car, just for this example, I use a size of eight millimeters. Um, but you can change that however you want. Okay. Oh, uh, you have a lot more nodes um, with the same settings. Hmm. Yeah, that's a little bit strange. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a good point. Yeah, check, check the units on your, uh, um, check the units on your hands just to make sure that they're in mil, I believe I'm in millimeters right now. Yeah, good call. All right, uh, so while you check that, so we have another question of, um, can we change the force in which the car hits the wall? So we won't have direct um, control over the force. Um, but what we'll see later is that we'll have control over the velocity. So we'll change the, that we can change the speed at which the car hits the wall. Um, so that's going to be later once we set the initial conditions. Yeah. Oh, yours is in millimeters too. Maybe, uh, Juan, maybe uh, let's, uh, let, maybe we can talk kind of offline on that um, kind of later on. Yeah. Uh, so the element order, uh, we, uh, so for the element order, we, we don't really have much control over it for dynamic simulations, just because uh, dynamics um, can be pretty expensive. Um, so uh, we're just going to let Ansys pick one. So what, we're going to leave the um, the order as kind of the global the global setting for that. Yeah. Yeah, Juan, I think maybe later uh, you can share your screen with me, and then uh, we can debug that. Uh, but let me kind of walk through this um, through, and then uh, I'll, I'll kind of work with you later on. Um, but if it's uh, if it's running later, then that's that's okay too. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions before we uh, we move on? Okay, uh, so let's um, go ahead and put in our constraints. Uh, so we actually don't have any loads here. So the only loading that we're going to apply is just the velocity on the car. Um, but we do have to fix the wall because we don't want this uh, to kind of go flying everywhere. Okay. Oh, question. Uh, okay, nice. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and fix the wall. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful here. So the, uh, you know, the kind of the tempting thing is just to fix this entire wall um, and say that the wall has to be fixed. Um, but when you have something that's colliding against something that's, you know, this, where this face is completely fixed, um, that can actually lead to some error. So you want to make sure that there's a little bit of compliance um, when you hit the wall. Here. So you're not literally hitting something that's, you know, an, immo an immovable object. Now, so you want, you want this plane of the wall here to actually be able to deform kind of uh, to be able to kind of cave in a little bit just so the car, you know, it has some give when the car hits it. So we're not actually going to apply a fixed constraint here. So what we're actually going to fix is actually all the sides of the wall around just like that. Okay. Not that one. This one. Okay. Okay. So to do that, let's go ahead and um, specify a fixed constraint. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that here. So let's go ahead and right click on explicit dynamics A5. And let's go to, um, insert and then let's go insert a fixed support because the fixed support will let us um, basically specify a, uh, a place uh, which is not going to move okay. uh, so we've done that here so uh, let's see so we have our fixed support so now we need to specify which sections of the geometry are going to be fixed um, so what we need to do is we need to select all the sides of this wall right here and make them fixed okay so we can uh, select multiple faces by clicking and then holding control and then clicking again, okay? So let's go ahead and control click. And then let's uh, control click on the uh, on the bottom face too. So we want to uh, basically fix 
all this lateral size of this wall right here. Okay. So go, once you do that, you can go ahead and click apply. Okay. Oops. And then you'll uh, um, have a uh, you're, you'll have your wall fixed just like that. Okay. What's this time out warning? Oh, I don't care. Okay. Uh, so we've go ahead and we fixed our wall. Um, so then now we uh, that's all the the constraints that we're going to add. Um, so we're not going to add any loads here. So the only load that that's going to occur are is going to be from the velocity from the from the car. Okay. Um, Oh, we have to fix the car too, sorry. So we have to make sure that our car is not gonna go flying uh, to infinity and beyond. So we have to, uh, to constrain the car so that it's only gonna be um, um, you know, moving in the X direction, okay. Ah, so if you can only pick the, uh, uh, the whole geometry, you, you wanna make sure that you're in um, surface selecting mode. So if you go to this uh, section right here, you can see uh, there's different ways that you can select. Um, so if you have this one selected right here, then you can only select the whole body. So you want to make sure you're on face selecting mode by clicking this. Then when you do that, you should be able to click the faces of the of the size of the wall. Cool. Okay, so the other thing that we have to do, which I forgot, is that we want to make sure that our car is basically um, fixed to the road. Because, you know, even though we just have the uh, kind of the chassis of the car here, you know, it's, you know, normally it's on wheels here and it's going to be um, hitting the wall. So we want to make sure the car doesn't kind of come off its, uh, its, its, uh, its path. So to do that, we want to make, we're going to specify that the car um, can, cannot displace in the Y direction. Okay? Um, so I think this is probably the first time that we've done this. So we're going to be uh, specifying a displacement constraint. Okay. Um, so the displacement constraint, it's a little bit uh, weaker than the uh, fixed support. So a fixed support basically said that, says that there's gonna be absolutely no motion at all. Uh, but what the displacement constraint will allow us to do is it'll allow us to constrain um, each of the different components of the displacement, okay? So you can see right here, we can uh, specify the X and the Y and the Z, okay? Um, so for this case, we only wanna specify the Y component, okay? Um, so before we do that, we have to select our geometry, okay? So this part's a little bit tricky. Um, so zoom in if you have to. So basically what we want to do is we want to select all of the kind of the undersides of the car like this, okay? So make sure you're on face selecting mode and click all of these um, underside faces here, right? So make sure you use control and click, okay? So I think there's eight of these in total. So you wanna, you wanna go around basically the entire um, car and select all these faces so that when you zoom out, all of these, um, all of these should be highlighted in green here. Okay. Uh, so once you've um, selected that entire geometry, go ahead and click apply. Okay. Um, so you can see now that we're applying a displacement constraint. So now we can basically um, set um, the displacements, the X, Y, and Z components um, for this car. Okay. Um, so I don't know if you guys can see it because right now it's kind of covered by. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, I minimized the uh, the zoom thing. So you can look at um, on the bottom right right here, we can see the X, Y, and Z axes for our, um, uh, for our, um, for our situation here. So we can see here that the Y direction is the direction that's going vertically up. So we wanna constrain that so it's gonna be zero in that direction, okay? Uh, so we can do that by going here and hitting zero on the Y and hitting enter, okay? And then by that, we can see that, um, you know, we have a constant value of zero here. So what that does, is it's, it's going to prevent the car from displacing in the Y direction. So the car can still displace in the X direction, which is in the direction toward the wall, and in the Z direction, but it can't displace in the Y direction. Okay? So that basically prevents the car from basically going into the road. Um, it also kind of prevents it from flying upwards, but, um, but that's okay. We're going to assume that the car is going to basically stay on the road um, throughout the collision. Okay. okay. Any questions on the uh, on the constraints? All right. So the question is, if you did want to go in the y direction. Um, you can, you can definitely remove that uh, constraint if you want. Um, 
So in, if you do remove that displacement constraint, um, then uh, the car can displace in the y direction uh, as well. So I think there's a way because um, you know what. Oh my god! Sorry, my cat just uh, dropped a glass off the table, which I will clean up later. Um, uh, so there's a. <laughs> yeah, she's hungry. Um, so I think there's a way to basically um, just make it so that your your car can't displace in the negative y direction, um, but the uh, uh, but you can have it displace in the positive y. Um, I just personally haven't looked into it. Yeah, yeah, so that's, uh, so you're right. So I think you would expect kind of the, the car to kind of lift off the ground a little bit, especially as it's kind of uh, compressing due to the, uh, um, due to the collision. Um, I'm just not sure how to, uh, to do that right now. Um, so for now, we're just going to make the assumption that it's not going to displace at all in, in the Y direction. Um, but I think there's a way that you can, um, you can make it so that it's, you can uh, basically constrain it just in one direction and not in the, uh, in the other. So the question is, could you import a body force to keep it from going to infinity? Yeah, you definitely could. Um, so you can definitely uh, import a, uh, um, some gravity in order to keep it on the ground. Um, but for now, we're, we, um, now we're just going to ignore that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, do have, you do have some crumple uh, for sure. Um, um, so you, you would definitely need to model that, I think, if you were doing kind of a more realistic simulation. Yeah, so the question is, how can we only just apply the displacement on the bottom face? Yeah, so that's a good question. So that's basically just to uh, kind of to, um, to account for the fact that we're, uh, we're constraining the wheels. Uh, so we don't actually have the wheels here in this assembly, so we just have the chassis. So to kind of account for that, um, the fact we apply it on the bottom face, because um, that's kind of the closest thing to the wheels, um, to the ground. Okay, any more questions before we uh, we get into the initial conditions? Okay, uh, so let's get into the initial conditions. Uh, so now we've uh, we've done all the constraints, but so now we have to give the, the car some velocity, okay? Um, so if you kind of think back to, uh, um, you know, your previous math classes, like your 308 class, this is basically setting the uh, the solution value at time is equal to zero. Okay, uh, so we basically need to do that here. Uh, so we basically need to define what basically all of our objects are doing um, at time is equal to zero. Uh, so we have two objects here. So we have the wall and we have the car. Uh, so the wall, um, you know, the wall is just doing its thing, so it's it's not going to be moving at all. Uh, so the default initial condition that ANSYS will give it is do nothing. And that's exactly what we want the wall to do. We want it to do absolutely nothing. We just want it to get hit um, and then just stay there. Okay. So we're not going to apply any initial condition on the wall, but we're going to apply one on the car. Okay. okay. So to do that, um, we need to apply initial conditions. So let's go ahead and right click right here. Um, so on the project outline, you should see a, an entry called initial conditions. So let's go ahead and right click that and click insert. And then we're going to insert a velocity initial condition because we want to give a velocity to our car. Okay. Right. Um, so just like any other object here, we, uh, we have to choose a geometry. Um, so we want to select this car. So we, um, we want to choose the entire body. So make sure you're in body select mode. So go ahead and click this right here and then click the, uh, the car and then go ahead and click apply. So now we're applying an initial condition in the, uh, um, for this car, okay? And then now we need to define its values, okay? So, um, you know, the default thing in ANSYS is to define by its vector, um, which is extremely annoying because it's, you know, usually uh, not the most convenient way to do it. Uh, so just like we do for any kind of force, we're going to define this by components, okay? Um, so to do that, uh, you go to your define by and click components here instead of vector. And this will allow us to select um, the X, the Y, and the Z um, components um, for, the, uh, for the velocity, okay? Um, 
So before that, let me uh, change units here because we want to change, um, we want to set the, uh, the velocity to 150 meters per second. So if your units are not in meters, go back to the home right here and click units and click uh, metric meters. Okay. Right. And then once you do that, uh, we're going to change the X velocity of this car to be minus 150. Okay. Um, so do that, go to this X component here, enter um, quick and then enter minus 150 and then hit enter, right? So make sure you're in meters because this has to be minus 150 meters per second, okay? Okay. All right, so that's the uh, initial conditions. Um, so we, uh, we're almost done setting all of the, uh, the parameters. So there's uh, just one more thing that we have to set. Um, so that's the, uh, the solution time. Um, before we do that, are there any questions on the initial condition? Okay. So when you're, uh, if you're using a dynamic simulations for your project and you have multiple parts, um, you really have to think about, you know, what are, uh, you know, what are the initial conditions that you want to set for your, for your objects, All right? So for this case, we have a simple case. We just have two objects, but if you have a lot, uh, you want to make sure that you set proper initial conditions for every single one. Okay. Okay. Um, so the last thing we need to do is we need to uh, um, set the, uh, an, um, the ending time. Um, because what the uh, analysis is, or what ANSYS is going to do is going to simulate the car crash from T is equal to zero up until some time that we, we specify, okay? Um, so to do that, we, uh, we have to go into analysis settings. So under explicit dynamics here, um, you can go ahead and click analysis settings and we can sp uh, set this ending time, okay? So you can see it's highlighted in yellow. So this is something that uh, we have to specify before we run the simulation. So let's go ahead and click this. Okay? So we wanna basically specify how much physical time that we want the, uh, the simulation to go for, okay? So you have to be really careful here because uh, depending on what you set here, it's going to increase the cost of the simulation uh, quite a bit. Okay? So kind of the rule of thumb for this is you want to give it enough time so that you can capture all of the dynamics and all of the kind of the interesting behavior that you want to see. Okay? Uh, so for this case, since we're simulating a car crash, um, it happens over a very, very short period of time. So we only need to give it just a very small period. Okay? Um, so the, uh, the amount of time that we're going to give it is 7.5. Um, times 10 to the minus four. So the way that we can do that is we can enter 7.5 E minus four, okay? We do that and we hit enter, okay? So if you set this to be something pretty high, like if you even set it to be just one second, then your ANSYS simulation is gonna run basically for forever because it's, it's, you know, it basically needs to simulate every kind of small, small increment of time all the way up until that one second. So it can be, uh, it can take a long time. Um, so when you're setting this, you really want to make sure uh, to ask yourself, you know, how much time do I really, how much time do I want to observe in this simulation in order so that I can uh, capture all the interesting behavior that I need, okay? Um, so for a car crash or for any impact problem, the, uh, the time is always really short um, because the impact only just takes place over a very short period of time. So you want to make sure that you set this end time kind of appropriately uh, for that, okay? Okay, any questions on, uh, on that? Okay, um, so that, that's all of the uh, kind of the essential settings that we need to run a dynamic simulation. So we have our mesh, we have our constraints, we have our initial conditions, and we have the, uh, the ending time that we specified here. Uh, so now we can go ahead and solve it. Uh, but before we do that, we wanna make sure that we can um, view the results that we want, okay? Because uh, remember, we have to tell, there's, ANSYS can tell us basically a lot of different information. So we wanna make sure that it tells us basically whatever we want. Uh, so let's go ahead and set a solution field for total deformation. So to do that, let's right click solution A6, go to insert, go to deformation, go to total here, okay? So let's also get the, uh, the equivalent stress or the von Mises stress like we usually do. 
And then let's also get the equivalent strain as well. Okay, so let's go to insert strain and then equivalent von Mises strain. Okay. Okay. And then once you've done that, you can go ahead and click solve up here. Okay, because we basically set all of our essential settings. We have all of our um, all of our outputs. So we're ready to solve. So let's go ahead and click solve. So this is going to take a while. So, uh, so dynamic simulations are a lot more um, expensive than, uh, than static simulations. Uh, so if you want to check the progress of your simulation, you can look in the bottom left corner here. Okay? So you should see a progress bar along with the progress uh, percentage. Okay? So you can see right here, mine's only 7% done. So you know, this is going to take a while. Um, but while it's running, you can actually observe it. Um, so to observe um, basically how your simulation is going, you can click this button right here called Solution Information. So it's right under Solution A6. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of different um, things that you can view. So the kind of the default thing is what's called solver output. So this is kind of the raw um, output that the solver is putting. Um, so you know this is just a wall of text. Um, so for most people, this is absolutely useless. Um, so this doesn't tell you really any useful information. Um, so what, uh, another thing that we can do is you can go to the details menu for solution information down here and you can change this instead of solver output to things that are more um, interesting. Okay. Um, so um, the one I think is the coolest is energy summary. So let's go ahead and click that. Uh, so once you click energy summary here from the details menu, you can see kind of a, a line chart um, for all the different kinds of energy that's happening in your system. Okay. And this is actually changing with time. So this is actually really cool. So, um, so um, I've actually never seen anything like this before doing this activity. So the fact that it can track this in real time is actually pretty cool to me. Um, so, what it, so what's happening is that it, it's, you know, for all the different kinds of energy that's, um, that's present in your system, it's, uh, it's basically tracking it over time and seeing how much is, uh, it's going on. Okay. Um, so in the blue curve right here, we have kinetic energy. So that's how much of the total energy is in motion. Um, so you can see that at the beginning we have very high kinetic energy. Um, so that's the fact that you know our initial condition is we gave our car some velocity to go forward. Okay. And then as you can see here, the kinetic energy starts to go down. So this is when the car starts impacting the uh, the wall. And then as the car impacts the wall, then that kinetic energy is getting converted to internal energy. So that that's internal energy of the car basically crumpling in on itself. Okay. So you can see it kind of like the car starts off with some velocity, it hits the wall, it hits some minimum, and then you can see now it's bouncing back and that internal energy is getting converted back into kinetic energy. Okay. So this is, this is actually pretty cool. I never um, um, know about this. Right. So the question is, what is hourglass energy? So that's, uh, so that's a good question. Um, a question that I don't have a great answer uh, for right now. Um, so I will, I will look that up and I will get back to you guys on that. Um, so I've heard the term hourglassing before as kind of a, a, a spurious finite element thing um, where uh, sometimes what can happen is that you can have um, basically the fi your, uh, your finite elements will kind of exhibit kind of, um, kind of an hourglass shape. So I don't know if it's referring to that, uh, but I will definitely look that up and I will have a better answer for you um, next time we meet. Okay. So the simulation is still running for me, so it's still 55%. So are there uh, any other questions on, on this that I can answer? So the question is, how would we add loading cycles to the uh, to the simulations? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so if you want to do any kind of cyclic loading um, for like a, like a fatigue test, I think um, you can uh, when you define like a pressure force or define like a load, you can uh, define it as a function of time. Um, so you can add like a sinusoid in there, uh, and basically that'll um, that'll give you a a cyclic loading in, in that case. Oh, multiple impacts of the car. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I, I've never done that before, so I, I'd have to kind of look that up and, and kind of get back to you on, on that. Yeah. 
Okay, so, so your laptop crashed. So the, uh, so the uh, velocity was uh, given by this initial condition. So you would have to right click initial conditions right here. And then you have to click insert and then you click uh, velocity from, from that. So yeah, so there's a, there's a button here for initial conditions that you would, you would do. So the question is, how do we add equivalent elastic strain? So, uh, so all the solution fields can be added through solution A6 right here. So you go ahead and right click solution A6, and then you click uh, insert. So I can't do it right now because it's, it's, it's running. Um, but uh, you click right click that, you click insert, and then you go to strain, and then uh, you click uh, equivalent strain. Right, so the question is, um, does the car stop once it hits the wall? So actually, no. So actually, you know, because we, uh, we didn't define any contacts between the walls, the car is actually gonna bounce back um, basically due to its internal stiffness, um, basically as you're, uh, as, you're, uh, as you're mentioning, yeah. So actually you can kind of see that in the, uh, um, in, the, uh, in the plot here, right? So the car, you know, once it impacts the wall, this is kind of when the, uh, the, the kinetic energy is at a minimum and the internal energy is at a max. But you can see, you know, um, as the internal energy goes down, then the car is decompressing here and it's basically bouncing back um, towards that way. So um, it does kind of bounce back. Uh, so actually someone emailed me a good question about that. You know, usually you don't expect, you know, the car to kind of have this kind of accordion shape like this. Um, and so the reason we, we see this accordion shape is because we're not modeling any uh, what's called nonlinear dynamics. Um, so basically we assume here that everything is perfectly linear. So we assume that the car is basically, it's basically behaving almost like a spring itself. Um, so the, uh, um, um, so the, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, there's no way for the car to basically store any plastic deformation. So that's why you kind of see this, uh, this result here. Okay. okay. So now that we've, uh, we're done, we can basically view the, uh, the results here. Okay. All right. So we can see the, uh, the deformation. We can see the, uh, the stress and we can see the strain. Uh, so you can see that we uh, we have quite a lot of stress. Okay. Uh, so actually, these results are a bit different from what I expected. Um, so let me uh, do something. So I think I think when I ran this uh, simulation before, I just I just let the uh, the mesh choose an automatic um, an automatic shape. So let me do that again. So all I did was I I, I went to the car method and I let it choose an, an automatic shape for that. So then we can solve this again. Okay. All right. So while that's going, um, basically you can view the uh, equivalent stress and the equivalent strain, um, and then from there you can start to answer some of the questions. So this in this activity, basically what I want you to do um, is I basically want you to play around with the initial velocity of the car. Um, so for this we set it to be minus 150 meters per second, which is actually really really fast. Um, so this car is basically, you know, hitting at it, hitting the, the, the wall kind of at the speed of a, of a bullet, um, you know, which is not realistic. Um, so basically what I want you to do is I want you to play around with this velocity here. And I want you to find out the maximum speed that the car can go um, before its equivalent stress exceeds its yield strength. Uh, so in the, in, the, in the document, I basically say that we're going to assume that this aluminum alloy that we're using has a fairly weak yield strength. So it only has a yield strength of 55 megapascal. Um, so I want you guys to play with this velocity here until you see a maximum equivalent stress of 55. Because um, uh, if your equivalent stress is, exceeds 55, then we say that the, uh, the car is going to plastically deform and your car is basically going to be totaled. Um, so I want you guys to find out what's the maximum speed that you can go without basically totaling your, your car. Okay. So that's problem five. Um, so I'll, I'll let you guys kind of play with the velocities and do that on your own. And then for problem six, what I want you guys to do is I want you to repeat the analysis, but I want you to change the material of the car instead of being aluminum, I want you to change it to polyethylene. So then we have a very different, um, you know, stress strain relationship. Your material is going to be a lot weaker. And then I want you guys to repeat the analysis to find the maximum velocity um, that the car can withstand uh, if it were made of plastic, basically. Um, so the yield strength of plastic, um, I'm giving it to you. I say that it's only going to be five megapascal. Um, so what's the maximum velocity that your car can go uh, before you basically reach five megapascals of, of stress within the car? Okay. All right. So that's problem six. And then problem seven, um, just like before, I want you guys to, to um, basically just write a quick summary of your results. Um, so basically as if you were kind of writing this to be a, uh, um, 
um, you know, report for, uh, you know, for your boss. Uh, I want you guys to basically just kind of write an email summary of your results. Okay. Right. So the question is, uh, can you see my solutions? Uh, yes, you can. Uh, basically after it's done uh, running again. Yeah. So I, I click solve again because I changed the meshing method. Uh, so once this is done, then uh, then I'll show you guys kind of what uh, what I have for this. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's this activity. So there's a, you know, there's a lot for you guys to do kind of offline as you change the velocity, but that's kind of enough to, to kind of get you guys set up and, and start. Okay? And remember, if you're taking this class for, uh, for graduate credit, then I want you guys to do a, a mesh convergence test too. Um, so basically, um, you know, what that entails is you're going to change basically the mesh sizing for the car and you're going to start off with a fairly coarse mesh and you're going to keep refining the mesh until you, uh, you don't see the, the stress change uh, anymore. Um, so I want you guys to add that to your to your assignment. So I'll I'll send an email basically to formalize that. Um, but I know I know there's there's at least a, a few of you guys in the class that's taking this for grad credit. So um, uh, so make sure you do that. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, we still have about ten more minutes in the lecture. So if you have any more questions, um, you know I'll, I'll be here to answer them. Um, and we also have office hours at five thirty. But at five fifteen, I'm going to sign off and clean up the broken glass that's on my kitchen floor. Uh, so the percentage, if you can't see it, you can, uh, I think you have to highlight your mouse um, over the bottom left um, and then it'll show you the, uh, um, uh, the progress there. Yeah, but hopefully, hopefully you should at least see the progress bar. Do you see the progress bar? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, did, I didn't activate anything by default. Um, if you click the solution information, do you see the, this graph basically updating? Um, for your, uh, um, for the energy in your system. Okay, yeah, maybe, uh, maybe you can just go by that. So we know that our solution is gonna end at 7.5 times 10 to the minus four. Uh, so basically once this reaches 7.5 times 10 to the minus four, then you can uh, basically set the, uh, see that as the end. All right, so Juan, your question was, yeah, so I, uh, um, so for the car mesh um, method, I basically changed that back to auto um, to basically let ANSYS kind of determine kind of the best uh, method for that. Um, so actually, you know, this, uh, this geometry was, was kind of um, tricky to mesh because it's, it's a thin shell. Um, so those, those can be really tricky. So actually, you know, the, the, the subject of the next activity is going to be shell meshing. Um, so we'll find out kind of the best ways to kind of mesh a thin object like this. Because actually quite a lot of you guys have, uh, have thin objects. Uh, for your project. So that's going to be the, the subject of the next lesson, uh, for the next activity. Okay. All right. So to get the, the energy plot, um, you have to click solution information here. Okay. Uh, and then you have to change this to energy summary. So by default, this, uh, this will give you solver output, which has just a, a list of numbers. But if you change this to energy summary right here, then it should give you the energy plot that I see right here. Okay, so my simulation is done. So let's uh, look at the uh, equivalent stress. Okay. And you can see here that we have, uh, we can see the stresses um, going just like that. Okay. Um, so you can see the maximum stress here is 2.177 times 10 to the nine Pascal. So that's way, um, oh, I see. So that's way above our, uh, our maximum stress, okay. So 2.177, E9. So we can divide that by uh, 1 E6. So that's 2,177 megapascal. So, you know, our car is basically being totaled, uh, which makes sense because we're basically shooting this car at the wall at the speed of a, uh, of a bolt. Um, so in order to, uh, to get this lower, we can lower this velocity here. So let's change this to uh, something more reasonable. So let's change this to uh, minus 10. And then from that, we can rerun the simulation. Oh, actually, before that, let me show you kind of a, a cool thing. So you, you can actually view a simulation of your car hitting the wall. Um, so you can uh, click this play button right here. If you do that, 
you can see your car hitting the wall and you can see it kind of bouncing back like that. Okay. So to see this, you can um, basically go to any of your solution fields. So in this case, I click the equivalent stress. And then in the bottom here, you can click this, uh, this play button. And then by playing, you can play the animation of your car hitting the wall. So it, this is not um, exactly a realistic, um, you know, result. So, you know, if you shoot a car at a wall at the speed of a moving bullet, you don't expect it to behave like it is right now. Uh, but remember, we're not uh, modeling any nonlinear plastic deformation. So this is kind of the best that it can do with kind of the linear physics. Um, so if you're doing like a high impact problem where you're kind of expecting a lot of buckling and a lot of a plastic deformation, um, then ANSYS uh, won't be able to kind of model that without, you know, you telling it to model all those nonlinearities, but it can at least tell you, you know, a good approximation of the stresses, um, which is kind of basically what we're using this simulation for. Okay. Okay. So I've changed the velocity down to minus 10. So I, I've reduced it by a factor of uh, over 10. So let's go ahead and solve this again. My cat's just sitting on the ground like there, like she's uh, she did nothing wrong. Cats are evil, but they're uh, very adorable evil. <laughs> All right, let me get my cat while this is running anyway. Hey, you'll come here. Hey, Carson wants to see you. This is my cat. Her name's Angel, but she's basically Satan incarnate sometimes. And we can't see it. Yeah, I've seen people, uh, you know, with uh, with cats with a similar pattern, and they name it Smokey, which I think is actually really cute because she, uh, her pattern is, she's she's part Siamese and she's uh, she's part tabby, so she has kind of the Siamese pattern, although it's a little bit um, blurred out because uh, of her tabbiness, and but she's she's really fluffy, so she's she's not really, um, that her hair's not that short, so yeah, she's cute. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cats can be uh, very mischievous. I won't use any profanity because this is, uh, I'm, I'm technically on paid uh, Cal State Fullerton time. So I don't want to get in trouble by the, from, from the Dean by, uh, by cussing on uh, <laughs> and during these lectures, but I agree. I agree with your assessment. <laughs> All right, any more questions on this activity or, uh, or, or the project um, or just anything in the class that uh, I can answer in the, in the last minute? I'll, I'll wait for this to finish and I'll, I'll let you guys see the results for 10, uh, for 10 meters per second. So you'll have kind of another reference to go on uh, when you do the activity. Okay. Yeah, right now it's at 55%. Yeah, these dynamic simulations are very, uh, they, they can take a while. Yeah, so if you, if, you, uh, if you have, you know, if your project is gonna involve some dynamics, uh, make sure you account for that. Um, you know, that your simulation is going to take a while to run. Um, you know, for individual ones, it's not too bad. Maybe you wait, may like, wait like five, 10 minutes, but when you're doing your mesh convergence tests, uh, you really have to be careful. With that. <laughs> yeah, if your computer has the, the RAM for it, you can definitely do that. But uh, remember, you have to do mesh convergence testing. So, um, 
So, you know, you have to, uh, you have to be careful with your time. So uh, usually uh, it, it takes me, um, you know, I usually have got the, the video process overnight. So I, I try to upload it to YouTube basically right after, uh, but then I trim it. So I, cause I, because I start the lecture kind of, or I join the, the Zoom room kind of 15 minutes early, I kind of trim out that first 15 minutes. Um, but YouTube for some reason takes hours to trim a video. So I'll, I'll post this on, uh, on the Titanium uh, first thing tomorrow morning. So on Thursday, um, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be going over uh, verification and validation. So it's kind of like part two of, uh, of the mesh convergence um, tests. Um, so I, I moved stuff around. So originally what I was going to do was I was going to do uh, symmetry um, and, uh, and reduced order analysis. Uh, but I feel like that goes better with uh, next Thursday's activity, which is uh, shell and plate modeling. Uh, or shell and uh, shell and B modeling. So I kind of switched the two. So this Thursday we're going to do uh, verification and validation or uh, V and V. Um, so it'll be a kind of a, a pen and a pencil and paper kind of lecture. So there'll be no answers. Um, so we'll just be taking notes on on that. Okay, so the simulation is done. So let's go ahead and take a look. So you can see here where, uh, um, you know, we have much lower stress. So you can see our maximum stress here is 2.28 times 10 to the eighth Pascals. So if we convert that to megapascals, oops. So you can see we're still over our, um, um, our threshold. So you can see uh, we, we're at basically 228 megapascals. So we're going to need to reduce the velocity quite a bit more in order to get below that threshold. Okay, uh, so that's it for the activity. So um, give that a try. So this is going to be due next Thursday, um, basically on the day that we do our next activity. Um, so give it a try. If you have any questions, uh, definitely let me know. Um, and then I will see you guys uh, on Thursday. Uh, yeah, so actually uh, right after this, I, I have office hours. So if, you, if you're still free, uh, if you can join the office hour Zoom uh, meeting, then uh, we, can, we can talk about it there. Um, but I expect, you know, we'll, we'll be having kind of a lot of meetings throughout this semester, because I think you're, in terms of physics, yours, yours is up there with complexity. So um, I think there will be a lot, of, uh, um, a lot of tinkering that we're gonna have to do. Yeah. So let me, let me clean up my kitchen and then I will meet you guys in the, uh, um, and the, uh, in the in the office hours if you're going to be there. Yeah, the next lecture is going to be on Thursday, so we have no more um, we have no more um, non-instructional days. So we're basically Tuesday, Thursday, basically until the end of the semester. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to end this meeting. I will see if you're going to come to office hours. I will see you in ten minutes after I clean my kitchen. Okay. Bye, everybody.